Welcome to Crop Sense, presented by North Carolina Cooperative Extension. I'm Jacob Morgan, a field crops agent with NC Cooperative Extension. Today we have Dr. Matthew Van, North Carolina State University Assistant Professor and Tobacco Extension Specialist. Good morning, Dr. Van. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Good morning, Jacob. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. So my name is Matthew Van, uh, as you said, and, and as you well know, uh, I'm the state tobacco agronomist. And I have been in that position now for about five years. Um, I was hired on after I finished my PhD in 2015. Um, I was born and raised in the tobacco belt in north central Florida in the Suwannee River Valley. Um, I grew up on a small family farm uh, where we uh, had, had timber and beef cattle and, and did what I call a little bit of truck farming with, uh, you know, selling some produce and vegetables throughout the summer. Uh, but as a kid, you know, certainly working in agriculture in a small southern ag community, tobacco was a big hub for what a lot of farmers and, and families relied on, you know, in, in my, I guess, of my generation. And uh, the first job I had, quote unquote, off the farm uh, was driving a 140 farm mall for a neighbor, basically trucking tobacco to the barn, you know, going and selling tobacco with him once a week. And I think that was kind of where I kind of got bit by the tobacco bug. So when I graduated high school, you know, went to college. I graduated from the University of Florida in 2009. I had a, a degree in environmental management in ag and natural resources and then double minors in agronomy and soil science. And as soon as I finished uh, my undergrad in 2009, I came straight to NC State and started uh, uh, working on a master's with uh, Lauren Fisher and David Smith, uh, focusing on potassium fertilizer application in flu-cured tobacco. Finished that in 2011 and stayed for a PhD and, um, and started that again in 2011 and finished it in 2015 and, and really focused on some, some core questions with some crop rotation and how having tobacco in a cropping system from a rotational standpoint can help with weed management, you know, from a bigger multi-year perspective. So, you know, really the bulk of my education has been in agronomy and soil science, and that's really sort of the heart of what I'm passionate about and really focusing on tobacco production. I come from a long line of tobacco farmers. My father was a cooperative extension agent in North Florida, and uh, he, he just retired uh, last November after, I guess it was, golly, 30 years of, of service with Florida Cooperative Extension. So, you know, a, a large amount of that was, was helping Florida tobacco farmers. So, again, I, that's very near and dear to me. And, and it's my honor and privilege every day to wake up and, and go to work to, to help North Carolina tobacco farmers be successful and sustainable in, in uh, producing this, this uh, cash crop. So today is May 18th, 2021. Tobacco transplanting is well underway and finished in some areas. We've got some growers that are, have been finished for a little while. Can you give us a quick rundown on how the tobacco season has gone so far? Sure. So, um, you know, unlike other crops, for, for those that listen and may not be familiar uh, with how we produce tobacco seedlings, unlike other crops, you know, corn, cotton, soybeans, peanuts, et cetera, we don't direct seed tobacco into a production field. You know, we start transplants uh, in a modified hydroponic system. It takes us about two months to grow transplants, and then we take them to the field. Typically in Eastern North Carolina, that's going to start, you know, roughly the first or second week of April, depending on, in, you know, outside environmental conditions. Uh, in short, we had a very good greenhouse production season. You know, again, it takes us about 60 days to grow transplants. So somewhere around Valentine's Day, we ramp up, you know, seeding greenhouses and getting that process started. Things went very smooth, you know, during the greenhouse season. And, and it's my opinion that at least while I've been affiliated with NC Extension, uh, this was one of the best greenhouse seasons we've ever had. Very little disease uh, incidents other than some of our, our normal uh, issues like black root rot and pythium. Uh, again, we see that year in and year out. But as a whole, our transplant supply for the number of houses that were seeded and the number of commercial transplant producers we still have, our supply was relatively good. The biggest issue we faced coming out of the transplant production season uh, into the actual field season is a shortage of transplants. And that sounds a little counterintuitive because, as I just said, we had one of the best greenhouse seasons that I can recall, you know, over the last probably eight to 10 seasons. 
But it's important to remember that we are ramping up production of flu cured tobacco in North Carolina uh, this year. We grew about 92,000 acres based off USDA estimates last year. And current estimates, at least from, from the numbers that I have, you know, in, in speaking with farmers and, and folks in industry, I think we'll probably have somewhere around 120 to 125,000 acres of flu cured tobacco this year. USDA numbers don't reflect that just yet. It, it any matter, I'm, I'm still thinking we're probably going to have a 20 to 30 percent increase in our, our production acreage and production volume. So when you have that kind of expansion in, in just one season, inevitably there's going to be some shortcomings. And I think that's where our, our really restricted, really tight seedling supply is, is, is coming to bear fruit now. So we've, you know, as you said, we've been transplanting now uh, since I'd say the first week of April. Uh, so we're really looking at about a month to a month and a half out from that, particularly as you look at some of the farms uh, going into Jones County and, and further places uh, south and east in this state. As a whole, now that we have, again, really gone through the peak of transplanting season, we've got, I guess, the, the perspective to kind of look back. And as good as our greenhouse season was, our transplanting season has been, has been really, really difficult. You know, we started the transplanting season. It, it seemed like we had some, some cool conditions. In some places we had, you know, some really damp soil conditions. And then it was like a, a switch was flipped and our moisture became extremely deficient. You know, you can even walk outside really, in my mind, for about the last month. And we've not had much humidity to go with that. Our temperatures have fluctuated not quite as extreme as I've ever seen, but, you know, we've had days where, where at least in the triangle, uh, it's been 85 degrees or, or maybe a little bit warmer. And then we've had days where we've had a couple of, of hard frosts and hard freezes within that four week period. So we had as late a frost as I can ever remember. We had two consecutive nights here in the triangle where we hovered around 32 degrees uh, towards the end of April. Uh, we, we came through that in a pretty good situation, but as I said, once that freeze and frost kind of lifted, conditions really began to, to deteriorate even further. We've not had really any substantial rain to speak of, you know, over the last three to four weeks in places. There have been isolated showers where growers have had anywhere from two or three tenths of an inch to maybe seven or eight tenths. We'll take anything we can get at this point, but we are, are really headed into a critical time where we just don't have a lot of soil moisture to help plants become established and really start to take root and take off like we would expect for a crop that's been in the ground for three to six weeks in a lot of places. So we've got growers now that where they can, they're trying to irrigate, and that's an unusual spot for us to be in at the end of April and early May. That's very uncommon for us. So again, I, I said that 2020 was one of the hardest growing seasons we ever had because of cool uh, conditions and, and excessive rainfall. And now we're really kind of in the opposite boat here in 2021. And I may eat those words, you know, that I, that I shared about 2020 at some point. So as you said, it's been mighty dry. So what effect has this weather had on maybe getting the crop established and also you know, we put fertilizer out or how much do we put out and weed control questions as far as getting stuff activated or better weed control, worse weed control. How do you think that dry weather is going to play out? So, so, you know, a, again, you can go wherever you want to in the state where we grow fluke your tobacco and you're going to find dry conditions. Um, in most places, we're probably two to four inches behind, you know, where we should be you know, for our seasonal rainfall to date. And, and what that means from a fertility standpoint is that we may not wind up applying as much nitrogen to this crop as we would in a, in a typical season. Uh, we did some work a few years ago where we looked at possibly scaling back some of our nitrogen application to account for dry growing seasons. And what we found was that we could reduce our nitrogen output by about you know, let's say by about 20% and still not have any kind of negative impact to yield or quality. You know, if we're in a situation where our growers have good access to irrigation, water, irrigation infrastructure, 
and they can put some water out and do that very proactively as needed, then I think we need to stay the course and really focus on, um, you know, our target nitrogen applications that would follow a normal extension recommendation. But if we're dealing with growers that don't have that, that option, you know, they may need to scale back some of that nitrogen just so we don't have it hanging around later in the growing season and really causing issues with, with greening and curing and those kind of things. So nitrogen would be the big one that I would focus on from that perspective. I would not get heavy handed at this point. If we transition and talk about weed management, you know, as I've been in commercial fields and been in some of our research plots, our weed pressure where we don't have irrigation going through the field has been almost non-existent, which is a great thing. We, we just don't have the soil moisture to get the crop, the tobacco crop established, and we don't really have the, the soil moisture to, for the weeds to, to get established. A lot of our growers you know, I would say that the bulk of the heavy lifting with a weed control program, so, so herbicides in this conversation, you know, all of, most of our herbicide application is taking place before a, a plant even goes in the ground. So we're talking about pre-transplanting uh, herbicide applications. This is a year where if a grower uses a pre-plant incorporated method you know, they've got some activation, they've got things, you know, in the ground ready to go, and they're doing their job. But if a grower has a, a pre-transplanting soil applied application that's not mechanically incorporated, they really need to be out plowing this crop to get that herbicide, you know, activated and to let it do its thing, particularly if they don't have irrigation. You know, we, we talk about the need to get these materials activated in a timely manner, and I think this is, this is the exact situation that we worry about uh, with those pre-T applications. So again, we've not had a tremendous amount of weed pressure just yet. We know the weeds are coming. It's gonna rain at some point. And if we don't have that herbicide activated or those herbicides activated, we're really setting ourselves up for failure. Uh, so again, I, we, we absolutely encourage growers, as tempting as it is to delay a cultivation uh, just because it's so dry and we worry about the soil drying out even further um, or even, you know, some soil disturbance that could, you know, hinder the growth of some of these small, very tender plants. If it's been seven or 10 days after you've transplanted and you hadn't done anything in that field, I would strongly encourage a grower to get out and do a very light, you know, secondary cultivation application just to try to get some of these products activated if they weren't incorporated before planting. So again, we're kind of staying the course on that. We've not, not seen a lot of weed pressure, but one of the things we talked about at our winter meetings this year was really pushing some of these lay-by herbicide options uh, for growers to, to strongly consider you know, this growing season. Um, you know, we've got concern about weed seed contamination in our, our cured tobacco and in our exports. Just because weeds aren't there yet, again, as I said, they're coming. So we need to be, be proactive. You know, these post-transplanting applications, we need to be thinking about them as the season starts to creep on over the next couple of weeks. Uh, minimal weed pressure now means that if we can get those products out and get them activated, we're that much further ahead of the curve and things are going to hold up pretty well for us. So again, we're going to stay the course on those as well. So it seemed like it rained all fall, all winter. And as we know, the rain can wash that sulfur out of the root zone. So is sulfur deficiency something you think we should be on the lookout for? Should we just go ahead and, and try to correct it up front with our fertilizer applications? Or do you think it's something that just kind of keep an eye on and wait and see? Yeah, so I think that's a really good question. You know, I, I was hearing some statistics from some of the weather services here. And at one point we were we were on the borderline of having, I think the wettest or the second most wettest winter on record here in North Carolina. And to your point, it seemed like it rained every day and didn't stop. So I think the sulfur question is absolutely, you know, a great one to ask. Sulfur is highly leachable. We think about sulfate be, having that, that negative charge associated with it. Our soil has a negative charge and you don't have the ability to have that binding access there. So we're fortunate in tobacco that, that with sulfur, you know, that, that is an, imp a, an important nutrient but we don't need um, any more than about 30 pounds per acre per season for maximized yield and quality. So one, I think in the, in the grand scheme of things, tobacco is probably a lower consumer of sulfur 
probably relative to some of our other crops. So that's a good thing, number one. Number two, I typically find that we've got good residual sulfur or sulfate in some of our, our uh, B horizons, you know, where we've got a, a subsoil that's fairly close uh, to, the, to the soil surface. So if we're within about, you know, I'd say eight to 10 inches of, of that B horizon, we've probably got enough there. We just have to get the roots down to it. To go with that, most of our, our fertilizers that we're going to use for tobacco production have a good charge of sulfur in them. So I'm thinking about so the two most common sources of potassium. So we're talking about potassium sulfate and sulfate of potash magnesia. So we're, we're thinking about KMAG uh, in that scenario. Both of those have a good slug of sulfur in them. And I argue all day long that when we target an appropriate potassium rate, so we're looking at somewhere probably in the ballpark of about 125 to 150 pounds of K2O per acre, we're bringing more than enough sulfate with those, those nutrient sources, those fertilizer sources uh, in those systems. So, you know, we've kind of checked multiple boxes when we look at our fertilizer sources. All of them are bringing sulfur with them. We still have a large number of growers that are using NPK, you know, homogenized or even some ammoniated fertilizers that have sulfur with them. Uh, again, we can check boxes there to make sure we've got enough. And we also have some growers that are using liquid nitrogen. And I think about one that I use in my program a lot is 28% urea ammonium nitrate. You know, I like it because it's liquid. It's got a small sulfur charge of about 3% with it. Um, we've also got some growers that use ammonium sulfate in some other custom blends, and it's got a charge of sulfur. So we're you know, we got a lot of places where kind of no matter where where we turn, uh, we got sulfur or sulfate coming to the table. So I'm not terribly concerned. I think there is a warranted idea that there could be some limitations, particularly in some deep sands. But my argument would be that if you have been, you as a farmer have been maintaining the pH of those soils like we would recommend, and you've been using dolomitic limestone, you should be bringing, you know, some of that to the table with you at the end of the day. So disease situation, uh, I don't know about the whole state, but back Jones County, Craven, Duplin, tomato spider wilt virus is a, mm -hmm. is a concern. Mm -hmm. Are there any concerns we should have as far as with the drier weather creating more of a disease problem or less of a disease problem? So that's a good question. And with the, with the tomato spotted wilt, the dry weather, we typically think about maybe exacerbating or aggravating some of those things at the end of the day. You know, I've, I've heard some of our entomologists say before that, you know, that, that sometimes the thrips are like us. They don't like being out in the rain and, you know, they kind of get knocked off some of the, the vegetation when that happens. So I think that that could be a problem, you know, but we also have to think about what was our, our tomato spotted wilt pressure last year? What were the thrips doing in the previous growing season, and I don't particularly remember there being a, a widespread issue of, of spotted wilt virus, you know, in that regard. So again, I, I think it's going to, I don't necessarily know that it's going to be any worse than the normal. And I think because the heart of our winter was so wet, maybe that's going to buy us some time. You know, to go with that, if we think about disease management and black shank and gramble wilt, you know, those two soil borne diseases being an issue that year in and year out are our number one and number two, I would probably have those a little bit higher on my concern list, but we typically see those aggravated by early season wet weather more so than early season dry weather. And right now we're in such a dry spell that I don't know we're, that we're really setting ourselves up for, for great disease losses in those regards, you know, as we get into to late June and, and July when we typically see them show up. So, as I'm looking at things right now, I hate to speculate too much, but I'm not really, you know, getting out there on a limb and really predicting that we're going to have above average disease losses this year, disease pressure. But again, you know, sometimes we think we've got things figured out with spotted wilt virus and lo and behold, you know, what we see in the field kind of bucks the trend as a whole. So um, it could happen, but as of right now, not. Knock on wood, I, 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 I don't really see it being a major, major, major issue. Is there anything we didn't cover that you think would be worth worth noting for growers in the next three or four weeks? 
so let me let me go back and, and address one thing with the fertility. So I, I got out on a limb and talked about dolomitic fertilizer. You know, we're not we're not getting sulfur out of out of the dolomitic limestone. We're getting magnesium and calcium. And and conversations, I guess one thing I want to elaborate on, some of the conversations we have with growers when they when they try to decide on what potassium fertilizer source to use, comparing sulfate of potash to sulfate of potash magnesia. One has magnesium, one doesn't. So a lot of times we tell our growers to, to make their decisions based off of what kind of dolomitic limestone they're using. When that happens, they may or may not choose to use a supplemental fertilizer that has magnesium in it, again, like OO22 or KMAG. And that may change some of the conversations about sulfur because inevitably one source of those potassium fertilizers has more sulfur in it than does the other. So again, that, that's kind of where the conversation about dolomitic limestone application comes, comes into play. And I just wanted to clarify that point that we're, we're not necessarily focused on sulfur in that regard. There's some other nutrients we're thinking about, but to trickle down into some of our, our supplemental NCs and fertilizer applications, it could have some, some implications as far as decision making. As always, we appreciate your time, Dr. Van. If you got a tobacco grower, friend, or neighbor, share this podcast with them. We'd appreciate it. And as always, thanks. Absolutely. We'll we'll push it out through our uh, tobacco portal uh, outlets and uh, some of our social media pages. So thanks for the opportunity to uh, sit down and have a chat today. We certainly appreciate it. And as always, thanks for listening to Crop Sense, because if it isn't making money, it isn't making sense.